Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce, or oh, hello, and uh, a someone who has a PhD in philosophy, um, who is also someone who has watched the channel and been involved in conversations. And I thought, let's just uh, create this perfect storm whereby he doesn't need to sit and watch a video. He can actually appear on the video. Uh, so thank you uh, uh, for agreeing to come on, Mark, and, and welcome Mark Capustin or Capustin. Yeah, Capustin is good. It's uh, Capustin. thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, I, I look forward to this conversation. I, I have a feeling, I mean, we just had a little chat beforehand in the green room, so to speak. And, uh, uh, you know, there's there's so many different subject areas we could talk about. Um, and who knows, you know, it might not be the, be, be the only time we chat. We could we could uh, do this again if there's sufficient enough content to, to get our teeth into. And I have a feeling there will be. So, Mark, uh, you are presently living in Canada. And, yes. Um, you, that that is that is obviously where you're or not obviously that's where you're from um talk a little bit about where you're at now before we do a rewind and see kind of how you got there and and talk a lot about your formative years because they're really interesting in terms of religion and whatnot but but mm -hmm. where are you now what are you up to um i oddly enough for my education and background I actually work for an accounting firm uh, preparing corporate financial statements and tax returns. Um, I was doing some uh, lecturing at the University of, uh, well, when I lived in Winnipeg, University of Winnipeg, University of Manitoba, and then here in the at Saskatoon, where I live now, at the University of Saskatchewan. And I had a couple courses one term, but nothing for the winter term. So I thought, what am I going to do with myself? So I just looked through some job ads and saw an ad for, you know, you can do taxes, we'll train you. So I signed up and took the what was going to be a four-month job, and they kept me on, and I now actually work for a big four accounting firm. So um, <laughs> I, I, I like the idea that you're going to be doing accounting with a PhD in philosophy and go, well, uh, but what what is the point of making more money? I mean, well, a sessional instructor was a very sporadic, unreliable income. So at some point, one has to just say, I need something more uh, reliable than this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's I got my PhD in 2007, and then that recession hit. And most of the places I applied to didn't end up hiring anybody. So yeah. And there were some family issues that required my attention and probably wasn't as productive scholarly uh, in terms of papers as I should have been. And, and uh, you know, that's just kind of the way it turned out. But, you know, I'm happy now. And There you go. And so, OK, let's let's do the big rewind then. So you uh, I, the way I understand it is that you had uh, a religious upbringing. This is uh, something of a more of a rarity in the UK, uh, very common in, in the US. I don't know. Canada always strikes me as somewhere in between. Like you, you maybe go out to the rural, more rural areas or the, more, the towns and it's, yeah. less, you know, there's religion plays a larger part in 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 people's lives. A, is that correct? And B, you know, talk a little bit about your, your upbringing. And yeah, I, I think that that is correct to a large degree, especially if you look at the demographics of, say, a place like Toronto, which is very multicultural and, you know, a lot, a lot different sort of environment than where I grew up, which is a small, near a small town, actually, really, to be frank, in the middle of nowhere on a little farm in Saskatchewan. And you know, our, a lot of our going to town, other than to buy groceries and whatnot, was to go to church. You know, Sunday mornings you go to church. I'd go to Sunday schools, my parents in church, and and um, you know, Sundays. My dad was very—he's a hardworking guy who worked full time and farmed too. And Sunday you did you you rested. You didn't work. You know, unless you had to harvest sometimes. But and um, religion was a big part of my upbringing i remember as a as a child having these picture bibles like comic book bibles and i would spend hours just reading through them and you get a slightly sanitized version of of a lot of the stories but you know those stories become a part of uh kind of embedded in you and 
you're you know you're told that this is the, this is what you have to believe if you don't you know there's obviously serious repercussions you know, you know i remember my parents being aghast because i liked hard rock music and had was listening to acdc and they saw highway to hell and they were uh giving me a stern lecture about how if i keep listening to this music that's exactly where i'll end up and it, we went to a pentecostal church so there was the whole speaking in tongues wow. um and it was very like you don't smoke, drink, or go to the theater. Even there was a joke that theaters had rapture-proof ceilings, you know. And uh, I think every Pentecostal kid has had this experience. You hear a sermon about the rapture, and you, you I take it you know what I'm talking about when I say that that people, yes. believers will be taken up, and everyone else will be left, and there's going to be terrible things happening. Um, when you can't find your parents, you start worrying, did the rapture happen? And I'm, I'm stuck here. <laughs> Left behind. Oh, my goodness. How so, psychologically damaging is that? But yeah. uh, your, your point about, the, um, about reading those sanitized uh, picture books is, I think, really important as to how children end up becoming adults who believe in things like Noah's Flood and Noah's Ark, which, yeah. you know, as an adult, you come to look at that. If you saw that in another religion, you'd be like, what a ridiculous story. That's yes, obviously myth. But if you're born and brought up into this uh, scenario whereby all your family and friends believe that, you're given books to believe, you know, that, 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 that cement that and you sing songs and you go to church and it's all this construct, then, yeah, you're going to believe that. And, and you're not only told to believe it, you're told that if you don't believe it, you will go to hell. That's that's pretty serious little bit of um you know perhaps psychological manipulation um mm. it a, a lot of this is very jarring if you step away from it and then come back to it and look at it um, i'll give you an example of, of a case where i found it jarring i hadn't gone to church for years and my kids uh their grandparents invited them you know, me to bring them to their church. The magician is going to be putting on a show. And he, he's an illusionist, a quite good one. It was an entertaining show, but he is also a minister. And partway through the show, he gives a sermon. Of course, you know, they, what they're doing is they're using the magic show as a hook to get you in there of and course. then evangelize you. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, look around. This room is populated mostly by children you're describing a roman execution of of great grotesqueness where they torture a person to death on a cross and not only are you describing this to children which in itself is problematic you're telling them you are the ones who deserve this your sin is what put that man there you're you're that bad that jesus was nailed to the cross because you that it's the only way to absolve you of the awfulness that's in you but, and did, I, did, you, did that sort of church believe in like you know trans world depravity or the, the idea that children are just born depraved and and sinful oh uh, yeah i think all pro all you know evangelicals generally believe that you know the original sin business and you know there's probably an age at which you're okay but once you know what you're you understand this you have to accept jesus or um you know damnation because there's a very exclusivist church that i was raised in and that this was as well as a pentecostal church so it's you know that's the impetus for people going out and doing missionary work is you know we're gonna bring food and medicine and whatnot and then evangelize because what really matters are their souls right yeah so you, you're you're at that point i was sitting there saying to myself i can't believe this was normalized for me for so long you know i used to go to to youth my parents would send me off to youth camp well as a, as a teenager you like going there because there's lots of fun things and pretty girls so mm -hmm. you you go but they have you captive sitting there for um there are sermons in which they tell you you have to come up to the front afterwards and everyone's going to pray and you're going to, you know, make sure that you're giving yourself over to Jesus fully or you're going to 
um, you know, you, you, if you rebel, that's that's bad. You're, you know, so. Give, give me a child at six and I'll give you a man, as a Jesuit priest said. And, you know, yeah. it's this inculcation of of people into effectively, well, I'd say a cult, but, you know, into a religious like community. Uh, and these children are, uh, I suppose, effectively brainwashed and psychologically manipulated into into this whole worldview. Which yeah, is... you, you believe all this stuff because, you know, your parents teach it to you, people you respect teach it to you. And I, I think that a lot of people are very well-meaning and not meaning to be psychologically manipulative. Even the preachers, they, they a lot of them believe this stuff. You know, a lot of the televangelists probably you know, it takes a back seat to their greed, but a lot of run of the mill preachers, I think, believe this stuff. And, you know, parents, I, I just cringe at some of it. I see people on, on Facebook, for example, wishing their child a happy birthday and saying, the most important thing is my child loves Jesus. And I think to myself, what, what are you doing to this kid? What if this kid in a few years decides, hmm, I'm going to question all of this. What are you telling them? Are you telling them that the thing that you value most about them is something that they have to give up. And, you know, you're, you're, if you're saying that's the most important thing is that they believe in Jesus, that's, that's, that disturbs me a little bit that somebody would say that the most important thing is you believe what I believe. Yeah, it's a blind obedience, isn't it? It is effectively what they want, which is, is, and that, there's a, I think there's interesting uh, psychological uh, research to show the correlation between those kind of believers and authoritarian parents and a belief in an authoritarian God. So it's like, you must believe this just because. And also, I'm the sort of parent who will take on the vengeful version of the Old Testament God. And that becomes part of the way I parent. And there's interesting questions about the chicken and the egg there. What comes first? Is it your kind of psychological disposition uh, that, that influences the sort of God that you that appeals to you and your sort of parenting? Or is do you morph into the God, you know, yeah. there's interesting causality going on there. But yeah, and, and and I think that you know it. I have a. There's people that convert to it as adults, but a lot of people you're you're just raised with it, and it it becomes as part of your identity, hmm. and you find it verboten to uh, you know question too much, or it's okay to question as long as you come up with the right answers at the end of the day, right? <laughs> And, you yeah. know, therein lies the rub. Sometimes, sometimes you don't. <laughs> so, um, well, what, well, well, let's talk about that then. Well, for you, what was the first, can you remember the first issue you had, even as a young child, that something um, didn't quite make sense? I think as a, as a young child, to be honest, it, the idea that somehow Jesus dying on a cross somehow fixes me seemed a little strange in that I didn't quite perceive the connection. Um, and it's something you don't really want to admit to people because everyone else seems to get it. But I think that that was the beginnings of realizing that the idea of substitutionary sacrifice, substitutionary atonement really doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's a very strange um concept uh, you know it's a sort of blood magic i suppose but yeah. you, you are you are spot on though because i remember well i, I was a i was a christian uh, i was a nominal christian well okay i won't go into it too much but really wasn't a christian until basically uh, my sort of secondary school it was more um involved in how we did had our school life so we had to go to chapel like three times a week and all this so you end up becoming a sort of a christian by default but but i'd sit and sit and listen bored to most of it but and and so i called myself a christian i've written about this before about you know no true scotsman fallacy because i called myself a christian but i didn't really understand christianity 
at all. In fact, it's only like 20 years later when I started getting into all this stuff where I was like, oh yeah. my goodness, my version of Christianity was some bastardized sky daddy that I would pray to at night just because I wanted stuff, or I wanted comfort, but I didn't really understand the theology. And your point about atonement is the key one there. So I used to listen, as everyone does in church, like uh, the idea that Jesus died for our sins. And I'm and like, you, you take that saying on and it just becomes, okay, yeah, but at no point did I go, well, actually, really, how does that work? Because I didn't uh, yeah. I, I didn't I didn't understand it. And now when I look back, well, now when I'm like, writing about atonement, it doesn't make sense. So I never would have understood it because it just doesn't make sense. Well, it, it doesn't. And, and I don't think that a lot of people who think they understand it actually do. Um, you, you look at Christian hymns and, and whatnot. They're all over the place. Uh, some of them seem to assume a sort of ransom ransom to Satan type of view. This is, you know, pe people aren't systematic theologians. They don't realize this is an official Christian doctrine. Um, so so there, I think the ordinary person in the pews views on this are a little bit all over the place. Um, I think when, when I started studying philosophy, what struck me was this seems to assume a sort of retributionist concept of punishment and justice. And the idea of retribution doesn't really make uh, complete sense. Um, you know, why? why? Why does, if, if I broke the law or broke um, a moral code or whatever it is I broke, I can see, you know, if I benefited from it, um, rebalancing the scale by somehow compensating or taking away the advantage that I gained or something like that, or if I'm dangerous, putting me away and keeping me away from other people. But just because I broke a, a, a law or, so, or a moral uh, precept or something of that sort, that I have to experience some sort of pain to atone for it, uh, to make it right, that, that in itself doesn't, you know, why? You know, Absolutely. And as I've uh, long taught myself, and I mentioned a lot in my book, 30 Arguments Against the Existence of God, which I keep banging on about. But if you add into that mix of what you're talking about, divine foreknowledge, where God fully knows that you're going to break that law, it, that moral code in advance and has de designed you in such a way that you, he knows that you're going to do that and that you do mm -hmm. that then retribution makes even less sense. And, you know, you can talk about yes. free will free will and ideas like that. But just in terms of God's foreknowledge, you know, retribution uh, and just the atonement then makes no, no sense because God knows what's going to happen, yeah, designs it, it such that it will happen, and then demands a price for that. It, it assumes a, a sort of barbaric, primitive concept of justice and punishment, the theory of punishment. So that I found problematic. And speaking of moral precepts, um, you know, it's, I'm fast forwarding a little bit because as a kid, I, you know, I, I would think about things, but you didn't really have the, you know, the intellectual yeah. tools to put it all together. Um, you know, I was always told that we get our morals from the Bible without the Bible, you know, where would we be? There'd be chaos. Everyone would, you know, be doing whatever they want and it would be debauchery. So I personally murder babies on a daily basis. Yeah. So I, I endeavored to actually, you know, I'd read the old to new Testament mostly to, to actually read the, I'm going to read through the old Testament and you see all this horrible stuff going on in there. I remember I, I got to a part where, you know, somebody in the conquest of Canaan kept some of the booty for themselves. So oh. God ordered them and their family killed the, the, the women, ch children, you know, the wife, children and animals. I thought, this doesn't make sense. Um, why would, you know, if, if I break the law, should my kids go to jail? I, you know, nobody thinks that. Um, so I thought it's, it's obvious here that we're, we're picking and choosing. And then, you know, I, t I went to Bible college and I remember taking this hermeneutics class and they, they you know, the, the, one of the, heuristics they give you is interpret scripture with scripture. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe this helps. But then you think about it. And I say to my, I'd say to you, I'd say to myself, how do I know what is the scripture that is to be explained and which is doing the explaining? 
people seem to assume that the stuff we like explains the stuff we don't like so that we can try to reconcile it in a way that pretends that the stuff we don't like is somehow compatible with the stuff we like. Which well, assumes you've already got a moral intuition in the first this place. This is exactly was, what I was going to say. Oh, so sorry. we're bringing our our moral judgments to to this. And then you realize, you know, upon it becoming more educated, there's been thousands of years of moral philosophy written. People act as if this never happened, that all we have are holy books. This, you know, things start, this starts chipping away at this system of, of belief that you have that thinks, you know, I'm evil, I'd be doing bad things if I didn't have this instruction book. And it's like, okay, the instruction book is, is far from clear. Um, we seem to bring ourselves to the instruction book and, and impose what we, what we think is plausible on it. So if you're interested in knowing how you should live, then maybe what you should do is, is look at the reasons you have for acting or not acting in certain ways. So, so what you're doing there is is you are illustrating perfectly well the problems with divine command theory. Like what one of the many issues. So divine command theory is that which God commands. That that's that is what makes it good, right? Because it's mm -hmm. in God's nature and God commands it. And one of my favorite the reason I'm interrupting you here is because it's a perfect like what what you just said there, bringing your own ideas to into play is that. When you say to to a believer, oh, you know, God commands rape in the Bible, and they say, yeah, but God would never command rape. And then you say, but how do you know that? You can only know that if you already know that rape is bad. And yeah. you would only know that by actually not reading the Bible, because actually it's quite confusing in the Bible. It looks like rape is, is fine in certain contexts in the Bible. So, so you saying that God would never command rape, is to assume a, a moral value code absent of God and divine command theory. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so through a, through a lot of this process, you know, I'm in Bible college and I'm trying to make sense of things. So you think, okay, so we need moral what, what philosophy. Age, sorry, what age are you at the moment at Bible college? Pardon me? What age are you at Bible college? Oh, I, in my early 20s. So, yeah, at, at that point, you know, you start saying, OK, I can still be a Christian and think the Bible isn't self-sufficient as a moral guide. We need moral philosophy if we want to sort of fill this out. Um, I'm not sure I understand completely the theory of, a, you know, the doctrine of, of atonement. But, um, you know, I, I guess I just put that aside for a while. And, um, you know, I remember reading passages such as you know the Romans 9 where it talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart and you know choosing whom he'll save and whom he'll not save I'm being quite disturbed by this and um, thinking to myself there, there's something a little funny going on here everybody around me seems to want to believe everything that's in here including this Somehow they all seem to think they're among the elect. How do they know that? Um, so, so that was something I found a little bit questionable as well, especially when, when combined with the problem of evil. And, you know, pe people in churches will often point you to the book of Job to, to address it. Then, then, you know, you actually read Job, and, and, and I'm getting to a point here in which I'm going to say something about why I think that Christianity is a, has a strong element of narcissism in it. Um, if, if you actually read the book of Job, for, put aside the, the fact for a moment that God really messes with um, Job pretty much on a bet with, with Satan, who doesn't seem to be his adversary, but more of a, his, his, mm. his agent in this case. Um, the adversarial bits come later in the Bible. But anyways, so God tests Job, or let Satan test Job, if we want to be more precise, by killing or letting die, afflicting, whatever, his family and his animals. So 
there's one guy here that matters, Job. And this story, as it unfolds, couldn't unfold unless there are a lot of people who aren't Job, his wife, his kids, and we'll include the animals just for shits and giggles. Um, they, they didn't do anything. What they are are mere instruments in the game. So here is my question. How do I know I'm Job when I read this? How do I know I'm not like Pharaoh who God is going to use to show, teach other people a lesson? How do I know I'm not Job's wife who has to die so that someone else can be better off at the end of the day? So really interesting way of looking at it. I love that. Thanks for thanks for bringing that to the fore here because I'm not really thought about it like that in the in the past. But yeah, carry on. That's, that's so so to be to to find any of this comforting, you have to put yourself in the center of the story. You have to be the protagonist. Why should any of just just playing the odds here in any one of these stories? It's actually not that likely. Um, because <laughs> because the, the the ratio of jobs to non jobs in the story is is not in your favor, right? If you if you are wishing to be job, so th this you know kind of segueing into the problem of evil sort of disturbed me because one of the things that well, I'll, I'll say a little bit about one of the, you know, talking about some of the things that kind of brought me along to where I am now. The, the, the first time I, I'd say I really felt the impact of the problem of evil is when I took first year philosophy in university and we read the bit from the Brothers Karamazov. And there's this story about the young girl who's taken from her mother and they're just begging and pleading that poor kind God or good kind God would save them. But eventually they so this child you know this description of this child being in terror for the night and the mother pleading for the child's life pleading that god would save the child and of course god doesn't the child is killed and these is is there anything that could happen at the end of all of this the end of time when everything is made right that can atone for that one child beating its breast in terror and I found this very disturbing. So uh, as, as I think any anybody, any humane person should. But, okay, so the Christian would say, well, they might live in heaven forever. That yes, child. but they, they might. But the, the point that Dostoevsky was making is, is, you know, is it really worth it? How does that make up for the immense angst that was experienced in that period of time? So th there's, there's, there's that they might live in heaven, and more importantly, that might be part of a soul-making process to get them there in a better state. So... I thought, okay, you know, for a while, you're probably familiar with John Hicks' argument against the problem of moral evil, the, the, the soul-making idea that, that, that suffering um, can shape us to appreciate better and all of this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, the soul-making theodicy, yeah. The problem I, I saw is if, if you actually, well, besides the fact that, that the things that people go through seem excessive for the purpose, how many, you know, children and whatnot don't get a chance to realize this? They don't they don't get to grow and and learn because guess what? You have a short, painful life and die. Yeah. So the suggestion that I've heard some people say was, well, maybe it's for the benefit of the parents or somebody else who will learn from this. Well, that puts us back in the situation where they're a mere tool or instrument for somebody else's benefit so if if you think like i do that that it's it's plausible that it's wrong to use someone who is an end in themselves as a mere tool or instrument for somebody else's end this turns existence into something quite horrible in many cases and god set it up that way 
Yeah, so William Lane Craig, for example, uh, has said, he said in debate with Lawrence Krauss in Australia, very clearly he said consequentialism is a terrible ethic. But what you're st stating there is that if that theodicy is, is or similar the theodicies, are you, in fact, every theodicy I've argued before uh, is consequentialist in nature, which is to say that, you know, why is there so much evil? Well, because of this greater good that comes about. So you yes. get a soul or you get to use free will or that. That's consequentialist. It means people can be used as instruments in order to achieve this greater good and can be used as instruments for someone else's greater good. And, so and not only can they be, the Bible's pretty clear that that's how God operates. Yeah. I mean, and, the, the flood, Noah's flood. Yeah. And, and this is you know, or the Job story or the Pharaoh story, you know, Pharaoh didn't harden his own heart. God hardened his heart. And then Paul's answer to this is, is highly unsatisfying where he says, who are you, old man, to question God? Does the, does the lump of clay complain about what the potter's made into, made it into? Well, the lump of clay doesn't have its own interests. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the lump of clay doesn't care. Whereas maybe I do. So lump, it's, lump, lump of clay doesn't get like murdered Paul, as being a firstborn. Uh, for example. Paul, Paul's uh, um, analogy there is terrible and any, everybody should think that. Um, it's, it's worth also mentioning, by the way, just, I did mention heaven, but it, absolutely has to be said every time that, that, that it was, I said that because I want to say this, which is that when Christians say, oh, it's okay. Look, I, that baby died after six months from cancer or whatever. And then it's okay. He lives for eternity in heaven uh, as well as all the other problems with heaven that exist. And there are many heaven does not morally justify. It only compensates. So, so for example, if I walked up to you, Mark and punched you full in the face and broke your jaw, and then afterwards, I said, oh, sorry about that. Here's $5,000. That $5,000 compensates you for the harm that was done. But it doesn't make what I did, doesn't make my action a morally good action. Yeah. Like punching you in the face is, now, is not now good because I gave you 5,000 quid. Or the only way it could be good is if you believe in strict a strict form of consequentialism, which, of course, Christians don't because you don't need God yeah. for that moral value system. Well, so. It, the, the, if, if, and if you buy into all of this, the word good starts to lose its meaning. God is good, but not the way we're good. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by good then? Why are you calling him good? You seem not to know what it means. Um, it, it, it becomes, you know, and, and the, the flu, hair and Mitchell debate where I, theology and falsification, you, you, you qualify God into meaninglessness. Yeah, he's 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 good, but not the way he loves us, but not 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 quite the same way. It's different, you know. A, a God who lets all of these things happen, but still supposedly loves us and wants good and can do everything that he needs to to get it there, and whatnot, starts to look really no better than a non-existent God. Yeah, because some... I mean, this kind of skeptical theism that you know it could all be ex there might be a reason that, that this evil and uh, and whatnot happens. It, uh, you can take that. You can do a reductio ad absurdum, which is to say that okay, Mark, imagine you are like um, tortured for like a thousand years, right? And then all of humanity's being killed. Your family's been tortured in front of your face, and and the most disgusting stuff's happened. Uh, you're the last entity on earth you don't quite know whether god exists but there's all this torture and death exists and then you could say well there could be a reason there still could be a reason this this is all happening god could still be all loving yeah like, if you got to that position then that's do you know what, what? William craig does william lane craig essentially says well you we don't know we can't know that there isn't some greater good to come of this yeah we can't but at what point does this become silly um, yeah, and, this was, yeah. And and then if you think about it and you say, okay, <clears throat> let's let's move past this <clears throat> and and uh, say, okay, free will can explain moral evil to to some extent. I'm not saying it does, but let's suppose that it does. And you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, all of these things are are are, are rare, catastrophic when they happen, but 
you know, it, it's sort of an impersonal, uh, mechanistic cause that, you know, just kind of shit happens. We'll suppose that for a second. It, it, the, the bigger problem seems to me just the way the whole thing, all of living organisms and how they become what they are and survive is set up. You know, we're, you mentioned the Darwinian problem of evil. If, if, you know, people would say, well, he, the, the fall caused, uh, you know, sin caused evil to enter the world. Well, what did a gazelle do to deserve to get ripped apart by a lion? They didn't sin. They, according to what you think, they, they aren't even capable of such a thing. Somehow or other, these other things are suffering for, our transgression, you know, our being said rather loosely here, because, you know, you and I didn't do it, but we, we inherited it, of course, which, which is perfectly sensible. But. But, yeah. and, and that's exactly right. So, so, you know, the, the, the why, why natural evil? So this kind of, uh, or animal suffering in particular it is, but you could include like plate tectonics and tsunamis and all this, is, is which also causes huge amounts of animal death. Why that's particularly strong as an argument is it that the usual theodicies, as you say, the soul building theodicy, the free will theodicy, don't work for these because well, um, you... they they don't work. And humans, uh, most of us in North America and and Europe, live, you know. We, we have various things that we suffer, but a lot of us live rather comfortable lives with amenities and a life expectancy of seven plus decades and whatnot. But that's the exception, not the rule. The, ex the rule in nature seems to be a struggle for survival. It is suffering. It is a cycle of things eating other things and those things then adapting to not be eaten. But the, by adapting to not be eaten, they give up something else so that they suffer in some other way. And the Christian answers that I've heard just don't seem to work very well. Like William Lane Craig well, said something along the lines of, well, if predators didn't eat the, the prey, then maybe those, you know, those prey would die of disease and overpopulation. But did that assumes that God had to set things up so that this way. God, God made the rules. Yeah. He didn't have to set it up so that um, these certain species of animals had to be either prey or die of disease. You know, yeah. So if you believe in omni God, that God is all knowing, all loving, and all powerful, then you have to believe that however the world or the universe is set up is the optimally perfect way. Either right now it's optimally perfect, or it's the optimally perfect way of obtaining some goal eventually. Right. So yes. we might not be at perfection now, but we might reach perfection. But this is this has to be the way of reaching perfection that has the optimal amount of suffering. Like if there was any unit more of suffering then that would be gratuitous. But if there was yeah. any less, it means that, well, this amount is gratuitous itself. So this has to be the perfect amount of suffering. And you think, really, could God not have managed to create the entire universe with like one less death in the tsunami? Well, and, and the way the lengths that someone like Craig goes to to try to wiggle out of this, make it start to look ridiculous. Um, one of the things I've read that Craig says is that as humans, we have certain things in our brain that make us allow us not only to feel pain, but to be some sort of, in some way, existentially aware of it. That animals aren't, because animals don't have that in their that mechanism in their brain. So they feel pain, but they don't have an awareness of pain, whatever that means exactly. Because generally, I would have thought to be in pain just is to be aware of pain. So you know. He, he uses the work, Craig uses the work of a chap called Murray, uh, I forget his first name, um, but anyway, about pain and, and biology. So Craig isn't the expert. And actually what happens is, so Phil Halpers, uh, who's also known as Skydive Phil on, on YouTube. So have you seen his his documentaries on YouTube about cosmology and the Kalam cosmological argument as Skydive Phil? They are amazing. But he's also done a bunch of videos on animal suffering. And in particular, Craig's claim in debates 
about animal suffering um uh which and he craig may i went to see craig against stephen law in in london debate i don't know 10 years ago now or something and he, he a lot of the debate was on this and basically craig's claims about pain and suffering in animals is not only wrong like he makes incorrect claims that that partly because he's basing it on someone else who's making incorrect claims uh and the philosophy is all a bit dodge and so yeah <laughs> yeah well it, it it seems fallacious on the face of it even you know and i'm not an expert in in animal neurophysiology by any stretch but we have the same evidence that animals can suffer that we have that humans can suffer so on the face of it anyways it certainly seems like they're suffering and to say that they don't suffer because you know despite feeling pain because they don't have such and such mechanism that we have that causes us to be able to experience suffering like that is a little bit like saying that you know the the bird flies because it has feathers the plane doesn't have feathers therefore the feather can't fly or the feather the the plane can't fly you know the plane flies via some other mechanism mechanism you know its wings are different than the bird's wings in some respect the the we we don't really understand the brain thoroughly enough to know how exactly you process certain lived experiences so, yeah i uh, I, I, on that, I just want to show you this. I mean, these are the videos I was talking about. So this is Skydive Phil, who has done, mm. you know, responding to William Lane Craig on animal suffering. Can animals suffer? Would it deb debunking William Lane Craig and other philosophers who say no? Why does God allow animal suffering? An atheist in a Christian debate, and God and animal suffering. Michael Murray, that's it. Theist versus Skydive Phil. So actually, Skydive Phil has debated the guy who. Um, who Craig uses to to base mm. his um, stuff, and then he's presented the problem of animal suffering. So go and check skydive. Just put it in I animal suffering. Definitely. William Lane Craig skydive Phil. They are really worth looking into because he basically takes apart um, Craig's claims. Yeah, so, you know Craig is kind of famous for using other people's arguments in weird ways. He does the same thing with Alex Belenkin's work. Yes. And I know it drives Lawrence Krauss batty because he clearly isn't isn't understanding it. And I don't you claim to understand Alex Blanken's work particularly well either, but um, You'll need to you'll need to buy my book, Did God Create the oh, Universe from Nothing? I will definitely do um, so countering William Lane Craig's Kalam cosmological argument. So that's, uh, I was talking about this book today on, on a comment because someone so, tried to get into a Kalam argument with me. And it's like, dude, I've written a book. I do, he's like, you don't know what I'm talking about. I was like, seriously, I do know what I'm talking about in this particular <laughs> circumstance. And actually Richard Carrier wrote a really lovely review for this book on Amazon saying, there are two books that totally destroy the Kalam and this is one of them you've got to buy it. And, but anyway, yeah. uh, you're absolutely right. So Vilenkin talks to the Borg Vilenkin theorem, the BGV theorem, talks about Craig used it to say the universe had a beginning, and it's like no, it says inflation had a beginning, and then before inflation, you know, when when physics breaks down, you can't make any predictions and blah blah blah. But it's like Craig, will, but he cherry picks his science, and he does that with using something called the neo Lorentzian understanding of, of you know an absolute time frame and stuff like that. So Craig, yeah, you're absolutely right. He's uh, uh, he does use people dodgily for for, yeah. for his own ends. So anyways, it seemed when I was, you know, even in Bible college still, I would bring this argument up with people, the, the problem of animal suffering, and they would just point me to Bible verses, and it didn't help at all. And I found that people weren't in, in those circles generally capable of understanding why it didn't help. So I would try to say, you know, my problem is actually with the book itself and the things the book is saying. So pointing me to the book isn't helping me here. I need some way of sort of wrapping my head around why what this book is saying is okay and makes sense and is acceptable. You know, to, to a large extent, I, I kind of just went along with for years with a lot of these concerns rolling around in my head. And you're, you know, you've got a family and both my side and my wife at the time side, well, every everybody's a Christian, every, you know, and and 
it, it's just what we are. It's what we what we do. You you go to church, and it's very difficult to take seriously. And when you're immersed in it, the possibility that I can live some other way completely. Um, you know, Pascal in his uh, the, the wager he says it, what you know when he makes his argument that you should bet on belief and he says he recognizes you might not believe uh, or find it very difficult what should you do then you know you can't just will yourself to believe something but what you can do is you say you can go to church you can sing the hymns you can read the scriptures you can do all of these things and the belief will come around so so if we do the right things a belief will follow and that that's quite quite a, I think, quite correct. You know, if, if somebody finds himself feeling very uncharitable and d dislikes uh, people who require charity, go and volunteer somewhere where you actually interact with them and help them out for, you know, selflessly for a while, I bet you'll become a much more charitable person. Um, and you'll start seeing things differently. So the, the, the sort of social setting you're in, the kinds of practices you're participating in these things sometimes tether your beliefs much more than your um you know rational mind does but you know you can you can only if you're if, if you're seriously philosophically inclined you can only sort of keep your your rational mind at bay for so long yeah absolutely and well i th i think what you were saying earlier about you know the theology is just the attempt it's just the attempt to keep these books or these beliefs or God and Jesus off the hook and at the top and untouchable. So the job I'm doing a series on uh, slavery at the moment, looking uh, it's like a book club uh, series that I've been doing. I don't know if uh, some of the viewers have been watching that. I've done, just done my third video on Hector Avalos's book. Uh, slavery abolitionism and the ethics of biblical scholarship and he talks about hermeneutics that, that theologians use and basically it's so obvious that they're just like right the bible can't be wrong it can't be <laughs> that the bible I've like seen some of the like, the, the, the bible uh can countenance slavery so we can't have that so therefore i have to bring to ta the table some kind of hermeneutic some kind of methodology that allows the bible the, the conclusion is i'm you know i'm going in with a presupposition that the bible is a-ok -okay, that god is a-ok -okay, and jesus a-ok -okay, therefore whatever hermeneutic i use has to lead me to that conclusion and yeah like, and and it's all part of a, a whole package of a way of thinking that you buy into and then kind of shape your endeavors around it. And, you know, so the philosopher Alvin Plantinga wrote a, a piece that's very, it was very influential, you know, for Christian philosophers, advice to Christian philosophers. And he said, you know, if you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about the things that are atheists are criticizing you for serve the christian community you know put put your mind to um working out the implications of things assuming christianity is true it's okay to do that and so it's and, okay to not have a justified belief just go and do nice things but but he he had a very elaborate justification for all of this it was basically you know i'd, I'd mentioned to you reformed epistemology mm. So he, he wrote a series of books, and I, I wrote an MA thesis on his epistemology. Um, warrant the current debate, warrant, it, uh, warrant and proper function, and then warranted Christian belief. Um, I think that that's what the third one was called. I, I could be wrong. But anyways, he looked at what, what is it that, that warrants a belief that makes the difference between true, mere true belief and knowledge? So... You know, we've got our Getty, Getty or problems that kind of show that justified true belief isn't sufficient for for knowledge. OK, everyone pretty much accepts that. So, so then, would, you, would you like to explain that a little bit for 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 everyone? Yeah, the, the I, I'll use something simpler than the Getty or problems uh, because it takes a few minutes to set up. But even a simple thing like if you look at a stopped clock and there is it says one o'clock and you look at the clock form the belief that it's one o'clock and it is one o'clock 
but you don't know that this, the clock has stopped. You've got a reason to form your belief. You, you generally trust the clock, so you, your belief might even be justified. But it's just a happy accident that you happen to look at it when it was showing the right time. You know, a stop clock is going to be right twice a day. So it doesn't seem like you actually have a sufficient basis for knowledge, even if your belief is true and it has pretty reasonable justification. So his idea is, is, is to sort of look at the factors that make a belief into knowledge in terms of it from an externalist perspective. So an internalist says that we can just look at the contents of our own consciousness and see what's in there and figure out whether or not we have the right evidence uh, to believe something is true. But here, here's the sort of problem we run into. You know, I believe that I had a hamburger for lunch today. You know, why do I believe such a thing? Well, I remember it. Well, why should I use memory as a basis for anything? It's, it's, it's not often reliable. And all it I seem to have going on in here is it just seems to me that this is true. And surely just seeming to me that it's true isn't really evidence. So what he says is going on instead is you have a cognitive, you have cognitive faculties that are designed to produce beliefs in you in certain situations. So when you eat a hamburger at 12 o'clock and your cognitive faculties are functioning correctly at two o'clock when somebody asks you what you ate you'll recall I ate a hamburger a couple of hours ago you know when my eyesight and perceptual faculties are working correctly I can look over there and say I believe there's clouds in the sky this is this is very difficult to to prove that there are in fact clouds in the sky because what's what I know for sure is that I seem to be seeing them, but you know somebody could be tricking me or something of that sort. But is it the fact that I don't know for sure that I that I know doesn't mean that I don't have knowledge? Because an externalist doesn't think you have to be able to know what you know. You know. Yeah. So there are there are different you. theories of knowledge, and and yes. you know. Uh, so he he hypothesizes that he said it, let, let's not be skeptical here for a moment and let's suppose that god exists and is something like christians believe him to be it's plausible then he thinks that we have that god would have created us with the means to know him so we'd have what he calls the census divinitatis the sense of the divine he says when we in fact look at humanity, religious belief is so prevalent. You know, it, it's not like a great pumpkin belief that everybody thinks is insane as soon as you say it. As soon as you say, I believe in God, most people think, well, that's plausible because this is this is the way people generally are. So he thinks that even if we can't prove that God exists, it, it might be properly basic to, to form beliefs about God given you know, certain circumstances. So he says what basic is something like, I look out at the starry sky and I feel a sense of awe and wonder and thankfulness to the creator for creating such a, a beautiful masterpiece. So he said, if, if he said, I can't prove that God exists, but if God exists, my belief might be warranted. And as long as there are no really good objections to my belief, then I'm fine in going along with it. So that's why he then goes and, you know, engages in um, his free will defense against the problem of evil, which, if you ask me, is answering a question very few people ask, because he's only interested in the logical problem of evil, um, yeah. as, as developed by Mackey. And, and that's not really the existential problem that most people are concerned with. And he, he, when he comes to natural evil, he kind of shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe demons do it. <laughs> so, so this, I mean, there are so much interesting stuff to say on properly basic beliefs. You know, the idea that if you get this sensitive in the Tartus, then why, why, why don't you take it one step further and have a properly basic belief in the right God? You know, you're yeah. saying, you know, there's this sense that God exists. So therefore, you know, that's 
evidence that God exists. It's like, yeah, but like most of the world believe in the wrong God or no God or, you know, so I'm not quite sure, you know, and then obviously lots of it's, arguments. It's problematic, about it. but to a philosophy student who's in a Christian environment realizes, oh, there are no really sound arguments for God's existence. Now what? Oh, here, here is like an out. It's like I can be rational and believe in God, even if the arguments aren't really that persuasive. Did, so did you? So, I mean, going back to kind of biographical point here. So you you went to university to study a PhD in philosophy. Did you go to university as a Christian still? Yes. And was your unraveling a, a gradual thing? Or was yes. there, there something that at one point you went, right, no, that, that's, that's well, really it. A, a lot of the things that I've talked about sort of rolled around in my mind for years. So, you know, the, this reformed epistemology business kind of kept me going a little bit for, uh, for several years. And, you know, there was, there was other things that, that I just kind of ignored and laughed, laughed off. Like, you know, for example, the, the, the churches that I went to, their stance on homosexuality. I thought, this is just silly. Like, but I'm not going to say anything too much about it. You know, I'll, I'll reason with who's going to listen to me, but I think they'll come around to it eventually. Attitude. I suppose you can maybe differentiate the intricacies of a particular church from a general belief in God, right? Yeah. So, you know, and, and you I, know, I complained a lot about sermons I heard that they were there was a lot of what I perceived as nonsense in them, but I thought the ministers were were generally well-meaning and whatnot. But where I it was, you know, it wasn't really till I sort of I, I ended up getting divorced and sort of was untethered let's say and felt i don't i don't have to please anybody else here i can just do what i want right, right i see that's yeah. when you start saying to yourself you know i don't think i really believe this stuff and and i'll, I'll t share with you something that it's to me is just so strange still and i, I it's to the point where i almost can't believe that it happened I was walking from my office in, in one of the colleges in the University of Manitoba to my classroom where I teach, was teaching philosophy of religion. And I said to myself, you know, it's curious that in every one of these debates, and, and, and I taught philosophy of religion in a very uh, unbiased way, I think. My students I was going to ask me, you about that, yeah. My, my students used to tell me they had no idea what my personal beliefs were. So I, I was proud of that. Yeah. That's but anyways, I said to myself, my assessment of each of these sort of units that we're going through is that theism loses every time. <laughs> theism just keeps losing. I don't really think I believe this. And then I stopped in my tracks almost in, in almost shock and said to myself, that doesn't work. How am I going to tell the family? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I yeah. think immediately my mind went to how awkward family gatherings will be if they realize they have an atheist in their midst. It's, it's not about the, the, the truth of these ideas, yeah. but the practicalities. Of, and, and, of and I literally said to myself, if I'm an atheist, it'll be awkward. And I can't fake it because I'm just not good at such things. So I, I almost felt like I had to somehow stick with it. And really, that's that's you know I, I've been reading um, Michael Shermer's book on the Believing Brain, you know, and and he, I think he's absolutely right that a lot of the time it's non-rational things that cause us to believe things, and then we rationalize them later. Oh yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. That was yeah. Definitely the case for me for years. I I think I you know I had social pressure to believe certain things, and I kind of caved to it and rationalized. Yeah, I, so I think if if you're if you're a Christian as a child, so if you're born and brought up as you were in this Christian um, worldview and in these communities, then you are taking on these beliefs 
in an obviously non-rational way, right? Because you aren't old enough. Your brain is, doesn't have the faculties, as you said earlier, to be able to question the atonement, to be able to question what's plausible from implausible. You don't have the scientific now, so you don't have the knowledge of, of X, Y, and Z. And so, yeah, you take that belief on and then you spend the rest of your life post hoc rationalizing the belief when you're old enough to do so. And yeah. then uh, if you're lucky enough, at some point, you, you, you know, the, the evidence is enough to to, you know, to leave you doubting. Well, you, you chip away for years like, you know, and it starts also with things like, well, the Earth obviously isn't 6000 years old. I literally remember w with the. Uh, it's a friend of mine having a discussion when we were in Lake Louise, Alberta, looking at a big mountain. And he was, you know, he's a minister now in a I think Pentecostal church. And I said to him, you know, young earth creationism just isn't plausible. Look at that mountain. We know how that was made. And it took millions of years. And he said he, he, he wouldn't believe it. He said, no, that's, that goes against the Bible. I said, well, how do you explain then what we know about plate tectonics and how mountains are formed? And he suggested that, you know, perhaps God made it look that way to test our faith. And I just said, well, then God is Descartes' evil demon. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that doesn't work for me. You know, because if God does that, I don't trust him. And it's the idea that the the and that if they then go to Satan, it's like you know how do you explain the fossil record? Well, Satan planted the fossils there. Yeah, but you do realize that God's all powerful. So if you didn't want Satan to do that, then he would just either kill Satan or just stop that from happening or reverse what Satan's done or whatever. So right. therefore, if Satan's done that, that is God doing that. That is basically on the behest of yeah. God. And um, I think that usually they're they're saying God did it, but just to test us, you know, to see if it's a test of credulity. Which, when you think about it, the idea that our eternal destination and well-being depends entirely on a test of credulity for something with, you know, evidence that we might rightly call thin, is, it, it almost seems like a bad joke. Why, why would God set up the whole scenario where it, it's all coherent? Like, if you're talking about theories of knowledge right and and truth there's the theory of coherentism so you get all these different theories of you know what you know what's that helps you tell what is true from what is untrue it's like well okay if, the, if this set of um claims are coherent with other sets of claims so for example plate tectonics is coherent with you know physics chemistry you know biology you know, geo distribution of of plant life works with how we understand mm -hmm. you know so you've got this massively coherent set of knowledge and you're like or god's just put it all there for a laugh well, for a test and it's like you know this kind of ad hoc bolted on set of you know it's like well it would be really weird if if god mm -hmm. is is testing us but giving us such amazing evidence <laughs> against his 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 existence like the test he's giving us is is really difficult to overcome because you talked about this earlier like when you, you didn't say the words but you talked about you, you can't just believe stuff Right. So this yeah. is called in philosophy, this is called doxastic voluntarism. Mm -hmm. So the idea that that if I said to you, uh, Mark, the moon is made of cheese, go and believe it. You couldn't make yourself believe that the moon was made of cheese. But that's not mm -hmm. how belief works. No, no what matter what's at stake. Sorry? When, when, no matter what's at stake, what's at stake has nothing to do with it. Exactly. So that's why the moon is made of cheese is quite a nice one because there's really not a lot at stake there. So, but but you, but you're right. Actually, if there was a lot at stake, still you couldn't make yourself believe it because there's not the evidence. At some point, your brain, and it's not a conscious thing, but at some point there is enough evidence that it switches, right? And mm -hmm. and your brain says, okay, I believe that. Or you sit on a fence. It's like you know, it's raining. It, there's a there's a there's a storm on Jupiter at the moment, or something like like that it's like well i have no idea i don't have enough knowledge so it's 50 50 yeah no. yeah and and, and I, I think that sometimes our you know we like to think we know exactly what we want what we believe all of these things that there's a certain transparency to our own psyche to ourselves but our we we, we can be very mysterious to ourselves sometimes it's very difficult to figure out what you actually believe 
Like we, we can have beliefs about our beliefs. Mm. Say, what, what do I think is the actual probability of this? And it can be very difficult to figure out sometimes where you actually sit on something. And it, it can take time to actually work that out. I, I think like, so, so, so what you, what it is you actually believe doesn't become immediately evident to you. And sometimes it can become evident in a mo moment of clarity. And, you know, I'll, I'll be uh, personal here a little bit and, and a little bit vulnerable, but I went through a very, very deep depression after being divorced mm -hmm. and, and was actually, you know, suicidal at one point. And I contemplated the idea that if I, I was to kill myself, maybe I'll end up in hell. And I stopped and said to myself, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that at all. I have absolutely zero concern about that. And that why, was, did, why didn't you believe that? What was so wrong about believing that? It just seemed to, it just struck me at that moment as so radically implausible. What is it from a position of moral intuition, right? You just I think felt so. that that was I, right. I, you know, I was mentally ill. I can't say that I was thinking, you know, thinking as clearly as I should have been at the time, but it was kind of like a, a, something I reflected on later. And, you know, I've been well for years now as, as a moment where I said to myself, it's like I discovered in that, you know, as, as horrible as that experience was, I really found myself in it. Um, you know, I came out of it unafraid to be myself and perhaps it's an atheistic soul building <laughs> yes, the Odyssey. and 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 i i think that it, that sometimes we can we we can kind of rummage around for a while in, in our own psyche until we actually have occasion to have the the true beliefs rise to the surface um I, I don't know if that sounds a little nutty. <laughs> well, but... yeah, I, I suppose it's all. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of times where we have intuitions in in life and we we definitely do scrabble around and try and post up rash eyes. I've been trying to work out. Like, I'm having a, arguments with one of my best mates who's becoming an idealist. So he believes that the that the entire existence is mental. And the, the, even that which we think is physical is mental experience of some other phenomena. And those phenomena are idealistic and, and non-material. And then so I'm trying to think, well, is my uh, theory or, or the idea that there is a material reality out there, is that just intuition? Like, how do I know mm. that? And so you know, I'm trying to work out in my own head whether I'm just post up rationalizing. Yeah. Am I really I'm, a, a materialist or... Is idealism a possible live option for me? That yeah, is it a live option? And actually, is my belief in materialism just something that's been received and that's something I haven't questioned and I don't have good reason to believe it? And you know, how, what does quantum say about this? And blah blah blah. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I just thought that was an interesting. Well, I, I find to political philosophy is where I really see more evidence of this because so it, we often have very conflicting intuitions about political questions you know there's a lot of cognitive dissonance and you know john rawls talked about going through a process of reflective equilibrium where we look at particular cases and think you know ask ourselves what what do i think is the right answer to this and then we compare that to our conception of justice and say okay given what i think about this particular case should i revise my conception of justice and given what i think of my conception of justice do i revise my judgment of this particular case and we sort of go back and forth until we come to a happy place so i, th I think with politics this happens a lot you know there's there's some respects in which libertarianism has some some things going for it and many respects in which socialism has some things going for it you know, I think I, I fall somewhere on a spectrum there. You know, I'm not deeply committed to either. You know, people who are deeply committed to one or the other will think I'm a wishy-washy moderate, but that's fine. Um, I'm just trying to find, figure out what's sensible. And if you ask me, what, what do you believe on these issues? It's like, well, I'll tell you once I sort out my cognitive dissonance.
Yeah, yeah. Pol <laughs> I think you're right. I think politics of all is all the things. I think there's a lot of intuition that goes into politics. And then there's a lot of post hoc rationalization. And there's a lot of things that don't fit in with with so society likes to be really like digital in in you're either this or that and and yeah. the idea that there's a political left right spectrum you know continuum is just the wrong model and in fact there's it's far more complicated than that and the, at least a quadrant of of the moral compass does a lot better than that sort of jonathan heights moral compass but even then it's it, that's arguably too simplistic mm -hmm. and and yeah so trying to work out you know you're trying to argue with people without even knowing where you sit on every single issue you're expected well, to sit on, on this issue because you sit or supposedly in this part on on the continuum on this on this idea and this idea and this idea and so therefore sh i should sit on there on this idea as well but actually i don't mm -hmm. and yeah it's, it's complicated. yeah this is something sam harris talked about he said um one of the problems we have now is people are so separated into their camps in which there's a whole you know system of dogmas that you have to to adopt to be in that camp that if you find out where somebody sits on one issue be it say abortion or climate change or any you know one of any number of political issues you can predict with a high degree of accurate reliability where they sit on a whole bunch of other things that have nothing to do with thing in question uh, I do that all the time. And I do that all the time with the GOP in America. Like, oh, yeah, you're going to be pro-gun. You're going to be this, 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 this. Uh, but I'm sure that the same could be said, you know, for the other side as well, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and, but it is becoming more and more divisive. And it's, and, and it's, it's, it's a very sad thing. And I've, I've, on Facebook a few times, uh, I've sort of tried to chastise some of my, uh, friend, people I know who are, um, you know, friends or past acquaintances who are in uh, ministers of churches, you know, conservative evangelical churches, because they're often very overtly pro, you know, conservative, whether that be conservative party in Canada or Trump in the, in the, um, in the U S and I try to remind them that your job should involve, you know, spiritual care for people of whatever um, political persuasion. Because I have a hard time conceptualizing this, making sense of the marrying of evangelical Christianity to right-wing politics. And I think I've mentioned this to you before. My family wasn't like this. My family, my mom and dad voted NDP, which is kind of, um, you know, almost a socialist party in, in Canada. The, wow. the NDP, Tommy Douglas, then uh, was called the CCF um, in, you know, I think it was the early 20th century. At some point, point in the 20th century is actually the originator of Medicare. Wow. So my dad used to say things to me like, I don't mind paying a little bit more tax if it means a guy with no money can see a doctor. You know, this this isn't what you hear in churches anymore. No, no. You, you, I think there's been a simplification of, of politics to do with all sorts of issues where everything gets lumped, you know, and it's all or nothing. And it's it's almost like if you're on the right now, you have to be a gun advocate. Like, yeah. Well, it's of, and and it's, it's, it, it, it means that this whole buying of a whole package, like, remember... Um, a family friend are kind of having a discussion with my father and saying, but the NDP supports abortion. He said, yeah, I know. I don't like that. But the conservatives just care about the rich. That's not who Jesus cared about. So at least, yeah. So that's interesting. So he's holding true to some kind of religious idea about who Jesus was rather yeah. than change so the prosperity gospel and all these ideas, you know, there is this interesting area in the psychology of religion as to what drives what does political belief drive religious. But I'm going to come to uh, Nuri in a second, actually. I want to finish this idea. So what drives uh, polit what drives, you know, uh, religious belief does politics drive religion or does religion drive politics and it turns out actually and so this may be your your dad's 
bucking the trend in terms of what the data shows. But the data tends to show, I think, that politics drives religion. In other words, your mm. religious beliefs supervene on your political beliefs. And they, they, there's lots of data to show that, that if your church doesn't say what you believe politically, you will just change church. Yeah. To, to find a church that does align with your politics. And, uh, and it can take a lot of courage for a, a minister to, to uh, say something that doesn't really fit with with the denomination's party line. So it's, it's not necessarily a party line, but what, what's prevalent. Yeah. Um, I, I know a fellow who's a, a minister. I think he's a minister too, but he's a, a professor at a Assemblies of God college in the, in the States. And at our Bible camp, he gave a, a, a talk on um, the history of Pentecostalism and how in the First World War, Pentecostals were actually pacifists and refused the war. And he was trying to make an argument that pacifism is morally respectable and has a, has a place in, in that denomination. And people were angry with it. He said that he gave that talk in Missouri, where he is now, he said that he had these Marines sitting in the front in full fatigue, staring him down with their arms crossed. So there are mavericks out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are always people that, but the, 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 it, it know, takes the some courage and, and, yeah. and ability to really think outside the box. So it's the exception. Um, thank you so much to Holy Humanist here. They're really kind. Uh, if you have any questions, get your um, get your super chats in. They're really, really appreciated, and they do allow me. You know, they justify me doing this. Um, so, as an ex-Muslim, just want to say thank you so much for these epic conversations. Thank you, Mark, for being a co-epic. Um, uh, would love to have you on my channel sometime for a tipple and a chat. Uh, well, absolutely. Just uh, hit me up on on Twitter or wherever or or on my blog or find me on Facebook. Uh, more than happy to do so. Um, I, I find Islam interesting for moral, political reasons. But I also I used to give a talk on how I think Islam is uh, not the religion of peace. And I think it's inherently violent and there's an interesting way that uh, the religion of peace gets argued into it and uses theories of abrogation, which is to say, if you have contradictions in, in the Quran, then which one, which idea wins out? And it, it, anyway, I, I, gave, I gave a talk, I used to give a talk, giving uh, a presentation that Islam is effectively a religion of a violent religion and it's inherent within islam and particularly the hadith and and i and I, ro I wrote some big pieces on this as well on my former blog uh and it was interesting that the most kickback i got was from fellow liberals liberals that, that mm. I hadn't actually read the quran and hadn't read any of the hadith but were were kicking back in a sense that look, by attacking Islam, you're attacking a, an oppressed minority in some sense in in the countries in which they lived. Like yeah, these, there's these fellow liberals. There, there is definitely um, an element of that. I, my mind right away went to Ben Affleck attacking Sam Harris on Bill Maher's show. <laughs> you know, it was a completely out of, he doesn't listen to a word that that Sam Harris actually said. No, he but. Just, but but I did ha actually have to then think, but even though what I'm saying I think is right and is justified and true, is there some argument that what I'm saying will give ammunition to Islamophobes who are, um, who, who would then, then, what I might, in other words, is, is, there, is there a moral case to suppress truth sometimes? Is I guess what I'm saying. Like what I'm saying, I, you're not changing what I'm saying, but if I am causing social division by saying it, then is there a case that I shouldn't say these things? Yeah, and that is that is a tough question, and and sometimes it it partly is a question about how much responsibilities do re is there on the reader to get it right, and how much responsibility is there on the writer or speaker to make sure they don't say anything that could be misunderstood. Yeah, I always preface what I was saying is look, I'm I am a, a 
bleeding heart liberal here, right? Yeah. But as a philosopher, I also like to to think I, I'm really interested in the truth. This is what I think is the truth, but I also don't want it to be used as ammunition for for social Islamophobia in, in that kind of social cohesion sense. Um, yeah, and, but, and uh, there there's so many phrases that one is probably wisely cautious to not say. You know, I won't say any because I'm wisely cautious. Um, because if somebody was to take them out of context and quote you as saying it, you guess what? You're all of a sudden, you've got a lot of problems. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and sometimes the, things like the use mentioned mention distinction gets overlooked, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, I want to uh, just come back to... Um, oh. This sorry, just a, a quote back from um, you know. But yes, I understand the social cohesion issue. We can definitely delve into that some more. So it sounds like a, we could have a good conversation. Please say them. The truth shall set them free, or at least that's the hope. Um, uh, yeah. So um, I, I wanted to mention uh, divorce again, only because. Uh, and sorry for that, because I know it's obviously a painful time for you. Not but um, <laughs> okay, cool. Well, so I've I, I know people that that actually really struggled with Christianity as a result of their divorce, but not from the kind of psychological position that you were talking about. Uh and in terms of depression and, and being able to cope in those ways, but in a theological sense that divorce actually I've I've ended up getting divorced, uh, but what but what does Jesus say about divorce and is this wrong? And actually, you know, really struggling to maintain a, a, a proper theological belief in light of the fact that they've got divorced. Did you ever think about it in those terms? Not at that point, no. Um, and and I think for most people, it's not too much. I could be wrong about this, but I, I, th I think that most people, except for the absolute fringe, are quite understanding that there can be, you know, uh, a humane way of looking at the issue is to understand that sometimes things just don't work out and that, that it's, you know, it's appropriate to, to love and support people, whatever choices they made. And, um, you know, not assume that they're just trying to be sinful or something like that, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, and I, I've seen very few Christian people actually being too judgmental. You know, I'd say within the last, say, 20, 30 years, I remember as a child, a friend of my mother's had a daughter who was getting a divorce and she was very, very troubled by it. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly uh, divorce has gone from being a real social no-no to being like the norm. Uh, and yeah. I suppose it's a matter of both statistics and maybe a moral shift. But, but you know, as you're saying, like 30, 40 years ago, divorce particularly in catholic communities was an absolute no no you know and now well, it's like that's why i thought that things will go the same way with homosexuality and same-sex mm. marriage because you know religious people made all these claims about how it's the glue that holds society together and now society is going to collapse because of, of the institution of marriage being wrecked and all of this and you know what happens is if you, several years go by, people realize the sky hasn't fallen. They might actually get to know some people in these relationships and say, hey, oddly enough, they're just like us. <laughs> and, and yeah, and it was the institution of marriage only held together by the fact that no one could get divorced. Do you, you know, because yeah. now that people can, 50% of marriages end in divorce. And so therefore, what is that institution, the institute of marriage, you know, in terms of what? what religious people think it is you know this man and a woman great thing but actually 50 percent of the time not so much and then the other 50 percent, i'm sure they aren't all perfect and so they're you know well if you want to, to have a completely biblical view of marriage anyways it's probably not pretty you know <laughs> especially the old testament we'll, we'll we'll trade you a, a daughter for a for a some animals that would be yeah great. And actually, well, West 501 here says there are definitely more divorces with church goes. There's some interesting stats that, that, to do with that, which is that I, I think, uh, and this is just off the top of my head, but I think church divorces, church marriages 
like that or religious marriages in religious communities often do end more they're more likely to end because uh, and i think the cause or reason is because people get married earlier and so when you get these early kind of 18 19 year old marriages when actually you haven't finished growing up you blah 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 and you haven't like got to know the person for too long as adults before you end up getting married they end up in divorce so yeah and there's interesting causality that goes on it, it is there's a certain counterproductive element to the idea of, you know they're real strict no sex before marriage um because they, they, you know, they're 18, 19, they obviously want to have sex, but they're told they're not supposed to until they get married. You know, the obvious inference to make is that we should get married, although probably most of them do what they want anyways. But, but you know, that keeps mom and dad happy. And um, whereas, you know, being a little less prudish about, <laughs> about that might serve somebody better in the long run to, to, to actually grow up a little first you know yeah absolutely um so i want to return a little bit to to uh and i know we've already been there but um the problem of evil uh the darwinian problem of evil i'm going to read it just a little bit because i know that that was something that you found you know was a real sticking point for your for your belief and it was a major part in your deconversion uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit from 30 Arguments uh, Against the Existence of God, Heaven, Hell, Satan and Divine Design. Please go out and grab a copy. And if you have read it and like it, please put a favorable review. Reviews make such a big difference. Uh, if you don't like it, just forget about it. <laughs> uh, so page 116. So, uh, but, but one thing that isn't really touched by these theodicies, so I just talked about the problem of evil and theodicies is natural evil. This is defined as suffering caused by earthquakes, tsunamis, natural forest fires, and other such natural events that cause untold harms, often to the animal world outside of humanity. A fawn dying in a forest fire after days of terrible suffering and burns, unbeknownst to humanity, has nothing to do with our free will, um, is very difficult to justify with original sin, and makes little sense in light of the usual theodicies. These natural ev evils seem to be more obviously unnecessary and more difficult to explain in light of omni-god. Surely, with these sorts of natural evils, a good god would want to stop the suffering and could stop it. Yet, it appears that the unnecessary sufferings still exist. Fawns still burn in forest fires. Undaunted, the theists can still posit that there might be a greater good or a good reason for such natural evil to exist, though they cannot easily appeal to any human-centric theodicy. I do think that natural evil makes it even more difficult to cook up some theodicy to try to get God off the hook. Animal suffering, as a result, is seen by many thinkers as the strongest challenge to the defense of the problem of evil. Here is an example of such an argument that could be formulated. So here's, here's a, um, a syllogism for the Darwinian problem of evil. God is omnipotent, omniscient and wholly good. The evil of extensive animal suffering exists. Necessarily, God can actualize an evolutionary perfect world. So this is a world where evolution can still happen, but, but it happens in such a way that you wouldn't get all the suffering that we do get. Necessarily, God can actualize an evolutionary perfect world only if God does actualize an evolutionary perfect world. So necessarily, God actualized an evolutionary perfect world, which is to say that the kind of, well, Five follows from three and four, uh, but we have a contradiction since five and two cannot both be true, which is the evil of extensive animal suffering exists and that necessarily God has actualized an evolutionary perfect world. Right. So yeah. it appears that one is false, that God is not on that You know, God is omnipotent, omniscient and wholly good is false. In other words, the fact that there is so much suffering. If God could produce uh, an evolutionary perfect world where evolution exists and we don't have you know, the amount of suffering that we do. Therefore, this looks to me like God doesn't exist. So the argument is to say, and sorry, I've done a lot of talking, is to say that God could predict the mechanisms of evolution and design one in which animal suffering is minimized. This scenario can be called an evolutionary perfect world. We could imagine a scenario where God could put in place an evolutionary system whereby, for example, just before a gazelle is given a killing bite by a lion, a gene is expressed that naturally tranquilizes the gazelle or such some such similar situation. But this appears not to be the case. Instead, we have 
extensive animal suffering that is hard baked into the evolutionary system and world. Indeed, this is a more formal iteration of the previous argument in the book about photosynthesis and why there is carnivorousness at all. And I'll go on to talk about that in a second. Yeah. But what are your thoughts about that? Sorry, there's a lot of me. No, that, that, that sounds like a very persuasive argument. And I think it's correct to say that the Darwinian problem of evil is the most difficult problem of evil for theists to deal with. Um, part of the problem is that pain is very painful. Um, and you might argue that, well, it has to be to perform its function. You know, you if, if it didn't hurt so much to put your hand on the stove, you wouldn't take your hand off the stove. But, you know, it could, it, it seems that what we're, we're, we've got now is a trade-off. Pain has to be that painful in order to perform its function of helping us remove ourselves from injurious situations. But that same mechanism is triggered by things other than, um, you know, the things that was sort of evolved to, to protect us from, you know. So the, the question is, is the system of trade-offs as good as it can be? And it would seem plausible to me that pain could perform its function if it wasn't quite so bad in most situations. Um, I, there's a there's a quote from a guy called Nagasawa who is I think a believer actually a theologian but it's something you said several times Mark which is that the the experience of of you talked about it with Dostoevsky the experience of actual suffering like the experiential terror of suffering is 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 something what Nagasawa says is 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 it something that really some kind of theoretical theodicy is just doesn't do like yeah there could be a greater good that could come about it could be the soul bird yeah but when you're actually suffering for the 15th day in a row in a torture chamber or something or like in a forest fire it burns it's like yeah that doesn't really cut the mustard for the actual suffering so nagasawa says i maintain however that theodicies do not eliminate the problem of divine absence so this is called the divine hiddenness argument altogether because they fail to answer the experiential problem which concerns the pain and suffering of real people People. We are mistaken if we think that theodicies can eliminate the experiential problem. That would perhaps be as absurd as thinking that we could eliminate a toothache with an intellectual argument. Yeah, and and I, I one of the things that that I, I I often feel as a concern is, you know, the problem of evil isn't just an intellectual exercise. It's an a, attempt to wrestle with the most egregious things that people are experiencing. So, you know, this isn't about you stubbing your toe or even things like, you know, being hurt in a car accident and, re re you know, recovering from it. You know, these are all things that are bad, but you can say, okay, now things are better. Um, there's a lot of cases in which things aren't better and never will be better. Um, the, the 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 Rwanda genocide is something that has always kind of moved me in that way. The the descriptions that I've seen of families being chopped up by machetes and the terror that they must have felt, the 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 horror of those experiences, it seems almost insulting to those people to say that I can make some sort of intellectual sense of this. I'm trying to find a quote because what you're saying is there's a quote I've got in my book here as well that basically says some people, some philosophers will say that even the process of creating a theodicy. So theodicy is a defense, a reason why is, is suffering or evil exists. Right. So you say it exists because of this. Now, you're talking about some of the worst things, which is genocide. So just the nature of doing a theodicy to to try and justify genocide is itself morally bad so there are some philosophers who say the process of creating a theodicy is an attempt to excuse the inexcusable it's so, always in bad taste you know that that that's not to trivialize it but uh, how how 
how egregious it can seem, but it, it does. It seems, you know, it's, it's in, it's almost like uh, in bad taste, the same way it would be in bad taste if, you know, somebody lost their child and you tried to comfort them by saying, you know, at least they won't have to suffer anymore. Or they're in heaven now, or, you know, the, you don't, you don't do that. It's yeah. just like, Let's just say that it's awful and leave it at that. <laughs> but but the whole nature of it is is like it's like saying right for me to go right the Holocaust has happened. How do I make this good? Do you know it's like the it's yeah. like the in most the the most heinous PR stunt. Like imagine and, being being God's PR agent and going right okay the Holocaust has happened. Six million Jews have died. They're your chosen people as well. How do we spin this? Like, how do we make it so that you still come out of this looking good? And which is quite different from saying, how do we learn from this and try to make sure that we are better human beings going forward? Because there, we're trying to improve ourselves then. And we're yeah. honoring the, the people who have suffered by trying to make things better for people in the future. We're not trying to rationalize how maybe their suffering wasn't as bad as it seemed. Hmm. That that there Absolutely. there is a, an element of distastefulness to it. Yeah. When, so to, when you look at the most horrific evils. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um. So when when you're talking about the argument from evil, uh, so the problem of evil and uh, the Darwinian problem of evil, this then becomes like with with that syllogism I, I talked about there and the evolutionary perfect, you know, world this this becomes a design argument actually which is why hasn't god designed a world in which evolution is is a much more benign process and then we get onto arguments about and you know a couple more arguments from here which is, is why don't we photosynthesize why hasn't god designed mm -hmm. us such that we derive all our energy needs from the sun so that we don't need to eat other animals animals don't need to in order to survive, merely just to exist, they have to cause the pain and suffering for other other organisms. Yeah, and th that's where you start looking at, you know, a sort of cumulative case for for atheism compared to a case for theism, and saying, okay, let's suppose that evolutionary naturalism is true. This all makes sense. This this process is is completely unfeeling and care there's no purpose there's no design to it just like the the wind that blows your house over doesn't care how much you care about that house um you know it's awful that it happens to you but it's it's just um the the end result of a process of mechanisms at work um you know like i've said a few times trade-offs happening and it's kind of given what we know about how this these processes work it's sort of what we expect to see yeah so is like is this the sort of world you would expect more on atheism or theism is this is it looking at all the data points to is this predicted on atheism or theism is this more likely the world we'll see on atheism and theism well and, and you have to give up your your we're the center of the universe perspective the universe really doesn't care about us and the universe is almost wholly it's not only indifferent to us it's hostile to us the, the fact that we exist on this little ball of on this little rock is is really quite uh, extraordinary but is completely explicable in terms of natural laws now of course there's the question of where did the laws come from um that's a difficult question. Um, what what happens when I say I don't know? You know, you know, not that I've never given any thought to the nature of scientific laws, but I'm not sure I can on the spot come up with an answer that's going to satisfy my average uh, interlocutor on on such matters. I, I I I would go to something I've labeled the argument from format, which I actually detail in my recent book. So it's just another spamming attempt. Uh, why I'm atheist and not an atheist. And one of the arguments in there is the argument from format, which is that if you didn't have a deterministic existence, ontologically speaking, bear with me, uh, sound me out, I'm sounding this out here to you, right? So, so literally, if there wasn't, 
full on causal determin determinism for everything. And I would argue even in terms of quantum. Um, but forget mm -hmm. that. But just, just like if there was a chance that something would decohere, you couldn't have like regularity in terms of like uh, Hume's kind of regularity, like everything it, it works to regularity, which means that we can label things. You, that's a that's a, a, a computer monitor over there because it has all the properties of being a com computer monitor and it doesn't you know, decohere and, and not be become a computer monitor because it exists in a framework that allows it to maintain itself regularly. If you didn't have complete regularity, just exist i i would argue existence would be impossible mm -hmm. so yeah, the reason I... the reason why there are law laws are descriptive they just describe how things are and and they're not prescriptive they're not created to make things adhere to it they're just the way matter operates mm -hmm. and matter has to operate like that because you wouldn't get existence and it just so you know so anyway I yeah it, 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 right it's, it's entirely possible that that a lot of the natural laws that we have or all of the natural laws, perhaps, are in some sense necessary. Um, I can't prove that. I don't think um, I can. I can assert it and say it's plausible. But if if just just at the end of the day, let's suppose I I settle on I don't know. Here's where the theist likes to jump in and say, "You don't know, hey, ah, atheists can't account for this. You don't know, therefore God." Well. If if you're saying I don't know, therefore God, you're basically saying you don't know either, because God isn't really explaining anything. You know what? What do we consider an explanation? And we, an explanation involves telling us which mechanisms and events led to a thing becoming the way it is, or something along that line. Just inserting God. God isn't an explanation. God is a placeholder. Hmm. Um. For, well, but you, you're quite often asserting something that's that's even more mysterious, right? Yes. So you know, it's it it puts you know, and eventually some of these gaps will be will be filled. Like I remember Alan Guth, you know, one interview I I heard with him said, you know, given quantum mechanics and general relativity, I can explain the universe, and you know, give you a pretty pretty you know what i think is coherent account of why it why it's here at all you know i can't tell you why quantum mechanics and general relativity um were there to begin with and i'm not sure if it's even a, and it might be a that might be a scientific question though but i'm not sure if it is or not because i don't know enough yet this this isn't an admission that god must have done it this is a an incentive to pursue further understanding. Such a beautiful way of putting it. So the idea that it's an incentive. So positing God is 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 a is a full stop to uh, curiosity. Like it's like if you just say because God, then there's no kind of desire to you know further understand reality. And and I think you know naturalism. It just is a worldview that 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 promotes and incentivizes curiosity, and theism doesn't. Yeah, and seeks explanations because uh, mm. you know I maintain that God isn't an explanation. That's that's not really um, performing the. If you think that God is an explanation, I'm not sure that you've understood what the word explanation means. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so just uh, as we trundle towards um, wrapping things up, if anyone has any uh, super chats or questions, please get them in. I just want to make a comment on this. This is what West 501 says. JP writes books. Yeah, we get it. I know I got one, whatever. <laughs> um, and, and so what happens is I've written something like 4,800 blog posts and articles and whatever and columns in, in my writing time. And I've written a dozen books. Um, and so when I go down the pub and have like chats or have a tippling philosopher's session, which we're having this week, actually. So we go down the pub and we'll talk about stuff. Literally, after anyone says that, any comment, I'm like, I've written an article on that or I've written a book <laughs> on that I, because I literally have. I've literally, because I write about stuff that interests me, mm -hmm. which is 
everything. So whether it be politics or science or philosophy, any area of philosophy, I'm like, I've written a book on that or I've written an article on that. And so I, I'm just- I like, envy your life. That's, I would love to be able to do that. <laughs> I'm, a stu I'm just a stuck record. Uh, so yeah, 501, I, yeah, sorry about that, mate. Uh, you are right. And I, I am, <laughs> I do bang on. But, you know, it's just because I'm like, yes, I have actually. And, you know, if I could if I could have all my articles and blog pieces and columns up here, I'd be pulling them out and it would just be <laughs> terrible. Um, anyway, uh, so, yes, if you have any questions, guys, um, uh, please, please get them in. Um, uh, is, is there any area of what we have have touched upon or what we haven't touched upon that you want to bring to bring to to the party? I don't know. I, I would, if, if there's another philosophical area that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, it would be free will. Mm. Um, I, 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 I've become, I've, I've, I've written a book on that. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I, I'm fairly convinced some, some sort of compatibilism must be true. Um, because, you know, libertarian free will is pretty much a non-starter. It, yeah. it just Agreed. doesn't make any sense. Um, causal determinism seems correct to me, and I, I think that you're correct to say even even quantum mechanics is a, a deterministic theory at base. And um, I I even ha hesitate to mention quantum mechanics because I've been in too many discussions where people bring it up in ridiculous ways. So I'll, I'll just sort of leave that. But at the same time, you know, even if causal determinism is true. We, we have incentives to want to praise and blame people for things, if nothing else, because, you know, just for practical necessity. And it might be one of those things where free will, even if it isn't really a thing, in reality is a useful fiction, because if you tell people that they don't have free will, they are known to act worse. Yeah, so this is uh, sort of free will illusionism, uh, and you're sort of referencing uh, P.F. Strawson, for example, as a compatibilist, but he was actually a causal determinist, but he he, he said f these things called reactive attitudes, which is what you're talking about, is we can't mm -hmm. get away from the fact that we want to praise and blame people for doing the things they do. Uh, he said that, yeah, we don't have free will, but... Uh, we might as well believe it exists because we can't get away from these psychological reactive attitudes we have. And Saul Smolansky was another one, wrote a book on free will saying his whole book was like, yeah, free will doesn't exist. Free will doesn't exist, but don't tell anyone because actually I think it's dangerous to say so. And so there are different, but there you get other determinists who would say, no, it's really positive if you, if you ex express uh, the idea that f we don't have free will because if we can we can reform the justice system and actually we uh, yes. if we understand this we won't get angry and all these kinds well of things. there's pros and cons to this and and you know first of all maybe Nietzsche was right that free will was a concept created by people who wanted to uh, justify their desire to punish but there there is serious pause to be given at the thought that let's suppose that I commit some sort of transgression that instead of punishing me, you know, fine or jail or whatever, depending on the severity of what I've done, the, the um, attitude of those who handle me at that point is to fix me. Mm. Um, you know, to what degree do we want to respect the autonomy of those who don't want to be fixed? Um, you know, treating everything as a, every nonconformity as an illness. Um, it, it's a little can start to sound a little dystopian if yeah i mean you know i think um i think yeah i i personally I, for me the the biggest um area of not interest but the biggest area to be uh to use the idea that we don't have free will in the most beneficial way is the criminal justice system is the idea that retribution as you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. you know retribution it doesn't really make a lot of sense well with the lack of free will it makes no sense so retribution shouldn't play a part in the criminal justice system it should be about rehabilitation it should be about um deterrence but actually you know deterrence is a kind of an odd thing psychologically so it turns out that the data suggests that 
harsh punishment doesn't deter people. And what deters people is is the under the percentage chance of getting caught, really. So Ooh. so when when you talk about like should I steal this, should I steal this loaf of bread from the shop, right? If I get my hand cut off for doing that, I you, people think they're kind of invincible anyway, so I think they're not going to get caught. Therefore, what's going to veto me doing that will be if I think that there's a ninety nine percent chance of me being caught, and actually that mm. that deters people more than harsh punishment. Yeah. And so, th therefore, really, uh, prison should be about rehabilitation, which is like if we're going to reintroduce you into society, I want you to be have all the skills to 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 reintegrate into society and not do that again. Yeah, well, and public safety, obviously, if somebody is not re, you know, you can't rehabilitate them, and they're going to be probably dangerous no matter what you do, then there can be a public safety case made for. Um, keeping them segregated from the rest of us um but that doesn't necessarily translate into you know you have to sit in solitary confinement and suffer yeah. so in um so people like greg caruso uh and Dirk Periboom, who are uh, philosophers of free will done a lot of work on retribution and criminal justice will talk about the quarantine theory which is like if it's so say mark you had a contagious disease right mm -hmm. What would be right for us to do in this situation, you having contagious disease, is to quarantine you so that you do not harm other people around you, mm -hmm. but we will keep you humanely. It's not like we're going to make your life a living hell. We will keep you humanely and we will try our very best to rehabilitate you. Now, if we can't rehabilitate you, so we can't get rid of the disease you have, then actually we'll just keep quarantining you you know humanely mm -hmm. for as long as we think it's it's necessary and that might be forever but it will be humane now it's exactly the same with crime uh so it's like we will quarantine you in 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 this in in this prison or system re rehabilitation unit for as long as it takes for us to rehabilitate you but if you can't be rehabilitated you'll be kept humanely quarantined yeah and uh as long as the rehabilitation makes sense, you know, a lot of people think just turn people to Jesus and they'll be rehabilitated instantly, right? <laughs> Praise be. Um, Mary M says, What a miss, um, uh, about animals. Uh, you missed a bit. Uh, did anyone bring up that Yahweh really seems to prefer the most innocent, perfect baby animals to have their throats cut for sacrifice? Probably uh, no, no um, coincidence. She has a picture of a what looks like a, a puppy or a, or a dog in her avatar. So, yeah, animal sacrifice. Yeah, what do you have anything to say about animal sacrifice or sacrifice in general? Um, other than it, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> and I take it that the idea is that you give your very best to god is 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 why you know if you're giving him the lame animal that's going to die next week anyways that's not much of a sacrifice so i i i, I would assume anyways that it's some sort of a uh, show of devotion to take your best animal and sacrifice that one so it's not perhaps not necessarily that god wants um you know is it, it takes a more sadistic pleasure in seeing a spotless animal killed it's that god is interested in seeing you know i'm putting on my christian hat here yeah, yeah, yeah god is interested in seeing that you're willing to give up your very best for him as a show of devotion god just loves the smell of burnt animals yeah it's just well you know it's smell. funny my 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 partner she uh does not have the upbringing that i had have had at all she's she i think she's she'd read a bit of the new testament and tried church for a short period of time and realized that she she said i i just didn't understand the whole jesus thing <laughs> so anyway me, me and her both yeah she read the first two books of the bible genesis and exodus and she couldn't believe what she was reading she wow. said this is horrible i've seen incest both forced and voluntary animal sacrifice murder like all these things and God seems to approve of a lot of this stuff. And he said, he seems like a, like a 
petulant child. What's he going to do next? Hold his breath till he turns blue? <laughs> but isn't that interesting? So you come from outside of this, from not having that inculcation of all that childhood kind of uh, normalization of these crazy stories. Like now, like I, I'm, I, I keep promising this, but I'm writing a book on the Exodus and, and the, the templates of Egypt are morally abhorrent. But I never thought they were morally abhorrent as a child. You just hear these stories about, yeah, Pharaoh wouldn't let the, the slaves go. So God came and did this and that. And and you're like, oh, 10 plagues and all, you know, locusts and this yeah. and that. And it was kind of like not fun, but like an interesting story. And it was like, oh, ah. but actually it's not that. It's morally abhorrent because he's murdering the firstborn of entire nation. And it says the entire nation, you know. Yeah, no, it's... uh it's easy to gloss over a lot of things when they're, you know, they're presented to you first as cute stories. And then you sort of maybe work your way up to some of the more serious stuff. But by that time, you've... You're already um, in there. Well, and it's, it's amazing how once you're, you know, I've, you've talked about this before. Once, once you've bought into it, you're, you're, you, you've kind of, put your your rational faculties to the side when it comes to the thing you've bought into because you know oh hindus think who is god that's crazy why would anyone think such a thing well i'm going to go back here and worship my car my jewish carpenter who uh was nailed to a cross <laughs> what yeah yeah, yeah. But, it's like i'm i'm going to take eucharist on a sunday which will actually turn into as a catholic it will actually turn into the blood of christ and it will actually turn into the flesh of christ because i am actually a cannibal well and it's what it's something that fascinates me and i love watching his videos brilliant man but rabbi tovia singer yeah he he gives the best takedowns of the new testament that i've seen anywhere he is so sharp he understands the hebrew scriptures very well so he puts the New Testament use of them into their their proper context and shows you, oh my, they're really misrepresenting what's going on here. So he's just this brilliant deconstructor of the New Testament, but he doesn't apply any of that to the Old Testament. He completely buys it. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and uh, you know it's it's just all given to us by God. So it. It's Perfect, fascinating yeah. to me, and and I, I I don't know him. I've never met him, but I love list watching his videos. He's yeah, brilliant. no, he, he's he's a funny guy, and he's he's interesting. And he, you're right, everything you've just said about him, absolutely one hundred percent. It's like, how can you be this good over here and not apply it over here? Um, yeah, it's it's frustrating. Um, okay, so as we as we wrap things up, it's time for quick fire questions. You can't think too much about these, Mark. Okay. Uh, I'll have my usual ones. I'll try and throw in a couple of others. You've answered my free will one I was going to throw you anyway. Um, favorite fiction book? Uh, the Godfather. Mm. I've never watched your Godfather films. I'm, oh not a, I'm not a huge gangster film fan. I just They're don't so well really done. like the genre. Two. The first two are really well done. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I don't deny casting. that at all. I, yeah, Good, I great assume. acting. The cast is is brilliant. But I, I read the book fairly recently, actually, after watching the, the movies a few times to figure out what was actually going on. <laughs> nice. Favorite nonfiction book? Um, the Bible. Yeah. I, I think the book that's kind of really made the most impact i mean the last 10 years or so non-fiction maybe lawrence krauss is a universe from no nothing interesting really enjoyed it because if there's one theistic argument that i thought have, might have some weight it was the just just the basic intuition that everything must have come from from something so that just the 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 the, the mere fact that you can give a coherent account of how you could get a universe from, I won't say nothing, but very, very close to it. Where, yeah, you know, so, I mean, he got into a lot of trouble. Not universe. Yeah, he got into so, a lot of trouble for, for like, 
is that really philosophical nothing but i think the takeaway from his book is like it, it there has to be something as in what what's wrong with saying that the universe is a brute fact or like, you know, whether it be quantum tunneling or whatever is a brute fact in the same way. If you're going to say God is a brute fact, and then that God is an extra explanatory layer onto everything. It's your, what you're presenting is even more complex and, and fails at Occam's razor than just the universe is a brute fact. And I'm or, a little, a little bit sympathetic to what he says about how, People seem to keep wanting to move the goalposts on nothing, because yeah. if you, if you've adopted stance of an ordinary language philosopher, we will use nothing to describe empty space, and we'll do mm. that quite happily. And he's even taking away space, taking away time, mm. taking all that away. And what are you left with? Well, maybe some laws of nature that perhaps are exist in a logically necessary way, anyways. That's pretty damn close enough to nothing to make me happy. Because hmm. if, if you can start with the laws, physical laws, and say, okay, from a state of this universe not existing, we get a universe. You know, even if it's part of a, a multiverse in which it's another bubble sort of nucleating off of the the, the rest of the uh, eternal inflation going on that's that's pretty good <laughs> it, yeah it's, it's a lot more than most theists think that we we're we, we're able to explain yeah yeah no good book um uh just as a hint for anyone who cares out there a couple of books that i've really enjoyed have been incognito by david eagleman which i really love just a real general popular book about the brain and how you know, human works and another one about human body which is adrian rain's the anatomy of violence or an an, an no the anatomy of violence where he talks about what makes humans like um have violent tendencies or antisocial behaviors just a phenomenally amazing book anyway too random i just i'll, I'll give a, a a shout out to Shermer's book of the believing brain as well because it's something that when my partner and I are traveling on the road, we'll listen to together and really enjoy. So. Oh, nice. Oh, good stuff. Um, okay, favorite TV show? Simpsons. Nice. Just simple out there. It's got I, love it. I don't know any of the episodes from the last 10 years, but the last first 15 seasons or so, just classic stuff. Yeah, good stuff. The favorite movie? I'm kind of a bit of a Star Wars geek. Well, Star really Trek like. probably more so than Star Wars, actually. Really, mm. and and uh, the Godfather movies as well. Good, interesting. Okay, um, so uh, if you could see a band that you've never seen before, uh, live in concert, dead or alive, the who would it be? Like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Why, why his guitar playing was just out of this world just left hand phenomenal. left hander left handed guitar it's player it's so innovative for its time yeah jimmy hendrix or led zeppelin jimmy hendrix you know virtually masturbating his guitar and then setting on fire and and is it the monterey festival is that in canada actually oh i don't know yeah anyway, no, he, was, he was he was fantastic yeah, um, but he, yeah, and playing with his teeth as well in that same festival. Anyway, uh, um, if you were about to be executed for, obviously, for, you know, apostasy, um, and you were promised a last supper, what would that what would that meal be? What would that food? Oh, probably a, a, a ribeye steak medium rare with the... Uh, Big potato, all dressed. Um, a Caesar salad on the side. Mean I've got a potato. Oh yeah, I like all kinds of food, but you can't can't be a good good cut of steak. You know, you and it's one of those things where, geez, I think the arguments for vegetarianism are awfully persuasive, but I'd have a hard time giving up steak. 
So I was, I was, uh, I'm a vegan, right? But, but um, I, I, for a long time, I became a vegan when I got multiple sclerosis because, you know, you got to change your behaviors. Mm. And there was, there's a lot of um, data to suggest that that's the right way to go, predominantly to do with sort of milk, but also the health and saturated fats and blah, blah, whatever. But before that, I always wanted to be vegetarian and wanted to be vegan. But like you, I was like, there are all these really good arguments, but I'm just morally imperfect. I can't do it. Whereas I've seen a lot of people who try and justify eating meat morally. It's like, no, nah, you, you, you're selling yourself out there. That Just at least just go, <laughs> it is morally better to be vegetarian. I'm just morally imperfect. And I can't Yes, that's exactly what, I, what I've yeah. said. It, I, I, I recognize the virtue of it and don't do it because I'm just not as good as I wish I was. Yeah. Um, if you were if you were forced to join a religion, what would it be? What religion would you choose now, knowing what you know? Uh, a nice one, maybe. <laughs> Is what, what, there what would that be? or something like that, where they think everyone just goes to heaven? There you go, you some have, kind of universalist. Then don't yeah. have to evangelize people. Which, when you look back at it, the fact that I ever thought that was a good idea is a little bit embarrassing and weird. Yeah, but, but what evangelizing, witnessing? Yeah. But no, I understand that. Like recently, I've come to think that that if you genuinely believe that everyone other than you guys are going to go to hell, then actually, you know, it is morally, it's an obligation, surely, as a human. Yeah, I suppose. Here, I'll give you an example why I say it's a bit weird. There was, happened a few years ago, there was, I was walking to my vehicle from work and this girl starts walking beside me. I'm kind of wondering, what's this young girl doing, striking up a conversation with me? She must want something. Yeah, so she yeah. starts talking about Jesus. Then she starts asking me what I think about Jesus and all this. And I, I was I was polite, but at the same time, I said, I don't know you. I've just met you. Isn't it awfully strange that you're asking me for my opinions on these rather personal issues? Um, I'd rather not tell you. You know, basically saying this is this is rather presumptuous of you to think that that I would just open up to you, a perfect stranger, about my beliefs and and personal feelings and all of these things. I just that's the it, difference between me and you, Mark, because I would be like, right, let's go get a coffee. I'm gonna argue the shit out of this. Yeah. Well, I had Jehovah Witnesses come to my door once I and love I it. was I love them. I was basically arguing that, you know, saying why I thought all these parts of the bible were just and i talked about sodom and gomorrah i said this is crazy like the story's insane and uh, you know the whole pillar of salt thing and everything i'm like really and she came back two weeks later with literature with stuff highlighted to answer my questions i couldn't <laughs> believe it i thought i i was just having some fun with you and you took it serious <laughs> Brilliant. But I love, I remember once, like ten years ago, I well, I was in the shower in our old house, and the, and the doorbell went, and it was like it was a Saturday morning. It was an odd time for the. It just felt odd, and for some reason, I knew it as a Jehovah's Witnesses, even though they'd never come before. I, for some reason, and I turned the shower off, and my partner answered the door, and I could hear her. And she said, oh, my uh, my partner will be really interested. He would actually want to speak to you, I think. And I was like, it is a joke. And I was like, jumped out of the shower. I was naked. I was like, trying to dry myself, got my pants on, <laughs> got my trousers on, just trying to get this T-shirt on with my wet body. Just eventually got down to the stairs, like out of breath going, yes, yes, I want to speak to you. They must have thought. I, I think like, you have oh. more patience than I do. Yeah, I just wanted them. I just fancied an argument. Because, um, like I said, I have I have fun with them, but then, yeah. like, I I don't really expect them to care what I think. But obviously, they did. They, yeah. you know, my question is, did they really think I was persuadable at that point? Yeah, it's like cut your losses. You know, it's don't chase the you know good money. With no, I, I should be considered good. a lost cause if anybody should. Yeah, and actually, you know. Uh, James, uh, well, hopefully I'm going to have a, a talk with James and uh, someone else on, on the channel who's a former Jehovah's Witness. Uh, so actually, if you want to learn about Jehovah's Witnesses and some deconversions, you know, stay, stay tuned. Um, so final question. You are just about to have your face eaten off by a zombie. 
so you quickly run down to your because you are a prepper and you have your cellar ready for these dystopian moments and you run down there but you can you you can just manage to be able to grab three other people dead or alive they can be figures from history you're not allowed to be family or friends okay. who would you t who would you take down into your cellar uh, where you'll hang out for a month oh geez i think albert yeah Einstein you could you could take jesus that's fine uh i'm not 100 percent sure if he existed so i might be down a, a person if i do that so maybe maybe if you say say i'm going to take jesus and you just get this two-bit like um itinerant preacher who really and wasn't I, all that i won't say paul because he would be insufferable i think the apostle paul he seemed like a very uh, unpleasant person um you know I, I, albert einstein would be great to pick his mind for a month i'm sure that he might, might even learn some mathematics then and uh See, I, I think I would go Sean Carroll, someone who's, you know, m more approachable in terms of understanding everything on a on a popular level. But anyway, sorry, I've like, asked you. I haven't asked me. He go. seems like he'd be fun because apparently Einstein had a playfulness about him. Oh, really? I, I think so. So so he'd, he'd be interesting. So Einstein? Yeah. Um, two more. Well, let's let's say Jesus, because on the off chance that there was a Jesus, so it's probably about 50-50. If he was there, that would be pretty awesome. It'd be, yep. it'd be fun to see what, what, what the person's actually about. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Einstein and Jesus? Um, I, Socrates. And Socrates. Yeah, it would be interesting to speak to some of those original Greeks and see actually how much you know how advanced they were in thought because we think they're so this but some of the greek philosophy was incredible what what would socrates was such a character that if if plato is telling us something even partially accurate after they pronounced him guilty they asked him what his punishment should be he said you should give me a stipend so that i can continue to benefit you <laughs> nice so, because I'm providing a service to yeah, yeah, yeah. the community, I thought the uh, sheer audaciousness of that is—I I don't know if people appreciate just how hilarious that actually is that he that he would have said that. So, given, I thought that, it, given that he's going down, yeah, yes, because uh, obviously that's not going to be his punishment. So he 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 knows he's going down at that point, and still has the good humor to suggest something outrageous, but from his perspective, perfectly appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, some of those great Greek thinkers would, would it would just be a treasure. Um, well, look, Mark, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, for me as well. Excellent. Uh, that's really good. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, is there anything else you want to add or to say? Um, you know, I've spoken quite a bit here today, so I'll just again thank you for for having me on, and I'll uh, I'll read some of your books and articles, and and then next time I'll if we were to do something like this again, I'll I'll know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, no, you're, no. You're, you're articulating it well. I can follow it quite, you know, quite oh, effectively stuff. as is, but. Oh, good stuff. Well, look, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And thanks to uh, everyone out there. There's been some uh, good conversation going on down on that side um, or whatever side. I don't really know. Um, and uh, it looks like I've got a talk with with someone else. So that's that's great. Uh, and uh, I will be having a, a, a Jehovah's Witness uh, talk coming up as well. West Fiverr One, thank you so much for your support. Great guest, JP. Thanks for the convo absolutely no worries uh glad to provide a service um as as i always say uh well thank you to your support uh but also question everything particularly yourselves and we talked a little bit about cognitive dissonance tonight and sort of you know do we can we justify our own beliefs make sure you do try and justify those beliefs but there's an interesting talk about you know do you try and justify belief after you've had it just for the sake of that 
or do you work towards a belief? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I do know, but you know, uh, this, that's another half an hour worth of conversation. So I just leave you with that. But right, uh, good intellectual hygiene, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good intellectual hygiene. What a lovely phrase. I love that. Um, uh, take care, y'all. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and toodle pips. See you again soon. All right. Thank you.